This scene from Don't Breathe is tense, lean, and in some ways emotionally evocative. It is a prime example of directing suspense within horror. And yet, can you remember this guy's name? The answer for most of you is probably not. These days, if it's not a superhero ruling the box office, it's usually a horror movie. With this influx of spooky films taking over the cineplex, there's been a lot to love, but also, well, a lot not to love. And part of this is because one of the key downsides that has been relatively noticeable for the past few years in modern horror is the way that these films have shifted relatively dramatically towards placing their emphasis on quickly communicable high concept ideas as opposed to characters. In the current media landscape, everything is viewed as a franchise. Films are constantly positioned as a transmedia experience, and as such, most of the stories that are being told end up stripped of their rough edges or idiosyncratic elements in order to facilitate reaching the biggest number of people possible. Simply put, modern day horror rarely feels like something an individual made. These films are sold off of the uniqueness of their premise, because that high concept idea is what horror producers are hoping is going to propel the film into a massive foreign and domestic box office return, video game series adaptations, clothing lines, and merchandising bonanzas. Look at the slasher genre, which is built on villains. When was the last time you saw a new, truly great horror villain? When you remove reinterpretations of already existing characters, well, it might be tough to think of an answer. Part of this is the reality that horror is a genre that does ebb and flow out of fashion. Just look at two periods in specific that spawned iconic horror characters in mass, the 1940s, which birthed the Universal Monsters, and the 80s, which gave us, well, all of those aforementioned slasher villains. The Universal Monsters were a roughly grouped pairing of fictional monsters largely taken from literature. Dracula, Frankenstein's Monster, Wolfman, Invisible Man, and The Mummy all gave shock and suspense to audiences during their initial theatrical run, and have since gone on to be viewed as cinematic classics, or at least ground layers for what came next. In the 80s, that latter group came into play, due in large part to the falling prices of film stock and the increasing demand from distribution companies in order to supply the booming VHS and Betamax marketplace, it became very easy for independent productions to create horror films that got widespread attention, and more pertinently, it became very easy to get those scripts greenlit. You'll hear a lot of stories about bootstrapped horror films from the 80s that basically started with nothing but an idea and were greenlit from there, patching together a script and panically casting. Many of these films were in the rapidly blossoming slasher genre, typically low-budget gore fests that feature some sort of madman stalking and attacking unsuspecting young people. This genre's tropes and staples quickly ran dry, and so filmmakers were forced to develop the central antagonist to structure their movies around. It couldn't just be a random person anymore. The more interesting and unique that central character was, the better that film ended up doing at the box office and in home video. So in many ways, these films were attempts at updating the eternal concept of the boogeyman. They took the trope of the outsider entering into suburban tranquility and exploited it for all it was worth. Instead, for now, out of this movement of largely independent productions, you got Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, Pinhead, Chucky, and a virtual army of other late night maniacs. These monsters and their victims propelled billion dollar multimedia franchises for the past close to 40 years. However, the market that spawned them, a rapidly growing initially largely independent home media based economy, is largely gone. The financial realities of producing a horror movie now are distinctly different. Today, horror is bigger than ever, however, it comes with specific restrictions. Gone are the lavish sets of the Universal films, or even the bombastic practical effects of the 80s slashers. Today, horror movies are created with a specific rubric in mind. High concept that easily translates, low budget, and a single movie star to sell the film. It's the Blumhouse model, and it works. It's easy. Films like Bird Box, Us, Get Out, and Quiet Place have all been very successful, and some of them very good movies. And the Quiet Place is a perfect example of the type of movie that producers are looking for right now. It's high concept, it's easily communicated through a log line, the trailer can sell itself in this world, if you make noise, you die. As the audience, we can very quickly expand that simple premise and gain a passing understanding of what the film would be just using our imagination. We immediately know if that's something we're interested in. Now, despite that premise, you still get a well-written story, a compelling monster, and characters that are serviceable. Now, are any of these aspects transcendent in this case? Not really beyond that. The cultural understanding of the movie is it's basically a silent movie. And in some ways, that novelty is its own high concept, its own draw. The characters and the monsters are second to the idea. Doesn't make them bad, in fact, in this case, they're quite good, but it's tough to argue that characters are of pertinence 
to writers of these kinds of films. A real example of when concept over character creates problems, and sometimes squanders potential is The Perch. This is where this idea of concept over character it doesn't pan out. For those not in the know, The Perch tells the story of a near future where one day a year everything is legal, including murder. It is a great politically relevant idea for a film. It has so much potential to be searing social commentary or dark satire. Instead, the initial purge spends 20 minutes watching a kid pilot an RC car around a house, mostly because the filmmakers didn't have enough resources because of these new criteria for creating these films, especially within the Blumhouse model, and had to instead rely almost entirely on the verbalization of the concept to pull people in. Not on building out that concept, not on making that concept relevant, uh, just the idea of the concept alone, which is why if you watch The Initial Purge, it's really nothing more than a typical home invasion movie. A reasonably watchable one, but nothing more than that. Purge 2, with a high concept like The Punisher on Purge Night, amazing idea for a film. And Frank Grillo, perfect casting. He could have played the Punisher in the MCU show and been right at home, and yet this movie too falls on its face. Modern horror just doesn't, for the most part, with exceptions, have characters that are enduring the way past generations did. These films are simply just trying to accomplish something vastly different for a completely different crowd. Horror in the 80s was aimed at convincing people who liked horror fans, again, to rent a VHS, whereas modern horror is trying to convince people all over the world to go to a movie theater or hit play on a streaming service. As such, what are the opportunities you're going to have to convince someone Someone to watch your movie, well, discounting the theatrical experience because it is a fraction of a film's lifespan, you basically have a thumbnail and a 200 word paragraph on a streaming platform. Now you could say what's different about that than Blockbuster, well the difference is you don't have tens of thousands of choices. It's pretty difficult to convince someone to click play off of a character description. Hockey mask wearing killer doesn't sound nearly as enticing as, it's a world where if you see the creature, you will take your own life. It's different. Ultimately, horror as a genre isn't going anywhere. It's been here since the dawn of creativity, in and outside of film. We need horror stories to tell us our fears are normal, to rationalize them, and that we are strong enough to sometimes overcome them. We need stories to help us understand the world around us through the lens of things that we're afraid of. I mean, think about it, modern horror putting the world front and center does make sense. With every passing year, reality feels more and more like a movie to an extent. People from all walks of life are questioning how the world functions and if there's even a place for us in it. With this approach of high concept over everything, we're missing out on Freddie, Michael, Jason, and we're missing out on leads like Sidney Prescott, Nancy Callahan, Sam Loomis, Ellen Ripley. I guess the point here is that, well, it's really easy to say almost all the time that this old thing you loved was better, that times are changing. Sometimes things change because the thing that you're engaging with is adapting, not necessarily changing in quality. It has to change because of the way we consume it or the way it gets created. Does it make it better or worse? You might argue that horror movies don't have the same luster they used to, but the genre does prove that art in general is a living, breathing organism to some extent. It grows, it changes, it has rough patches, and that's at every level, including yourself, your personal level. Your art will change, your art will grow. It won't always be great, it won't always get better, it might get worse, but it's evolving. And that's what being an artist, and that's what art really is. Evolution that you can see. Well guys, that's it for today's episode of Nerdstology. If you enjoyed this one, press the like button down below. As always, if you haven't yet done so, hit subscribe so you don't miss anything. On your screen right now, two more episodes, click on those, stay here. You know the drill. I'll see you guys in the next one.